Welcome. So this presentation is about Olympia Maidokini, the woman who ruled over the Vatican for over 10 years. And in preparing for this presentation, I read this book, Mistress of the Vatican, the true story of Olympia Maidokini, the secret female pope. And the author is Eleanor Herman. It's a wonderful book, really thoroughly researched. I can't recommend it enough. And I made my own handwritten notes to summarize the story and did some additional research. And uh, this is the result I'm going to present to you. I hope you like it. I'll share my screen now and then we'll proceed. Okay, here we go. So the Vatican is the oldest royal court in Europe. And what happens in the Vatican stays in the Vatican most of the time. Well, not the story about a brazen woman named Olympia who got to lord over the original old boys club. Let's meet Olympia. When it comes to bastions of male power, they don't come much more exclusive than the Vatican, or so you might think. But one woman tore down its walls, hated by jealous men, but adored by women. Donna Olympia Maidalkini was Pope in all but name. She was painted by perhaps the greatest ever portrait artist. But like the woman herself, the painting's been all but lost to history for almost 300 years. When they compile those lists of paintings to see before you die, they're talking about works like these by Diego Velázquez, one of the greatest old master painters. When he went to Rome in 1650, the Pope, Innocent X, sat to him. This is considered one of the greatest pictures ever painted. But Velázquez made time for another VIP at the Vatican, too. She was a woman, the Pope's sister-in-law and his reputed lover, Donna Olympia. Lost for some three centuries, the Velázquez Olympia is going on sale at Sotheby's in London. Olympia would have loved the fact that I'm the one having the makeup. Uh, <laughs> Velázquez would have been very busy while he was in Rome. His predominant mission there was to uh, paint a portrait of Pope Innocent X. He would have had only a limited amount of time to actually be painting. And uh, I rather like the idea that Donna Olympia would have made certain that uh, she was able to sit to this great Spanish master. All right. So Olympia was born on the 26th of May, 1591 in the Terrible. This is the only uh, picture of her as a young person that I was able to find. So as was customary back then, she was baptized the same day she was born. Her father, Sforza Maidalkini, was very disappointed that his wife had made a girl because he wanted a son. Sforza had been born into poverty, but he was a very driven and determined person. And so through sheer ambition, he had climbed the uh, career ladder to become the tax collector in Viterbo. His position placed him in regular contact with all the power brokers and the richest people in town. After all, it was his duty to assess their property and income. And so he used this to his advantage, befriending them, making himself indispensable to them. And as he came to depend on him, his prestige grew. The forecast looked good. He was raking in the money. And after his first wife died, he was able to remarry a nobleman's daughter, just a minor noble. And the marriage brought in even more money and a large home because women always uh, brought a dowry when getting married back then. 
His first wife had given him a son already, which was great. But Sforza had uh, big plans. So, so now he had an heir, but he wanted a spare. You see, he was focused on building a dynasty. Not only would both sons carry the Maidalkini name, but they would also marry well and bring more wealth and prestige to the family. On the other hand, a daughter would deplete his wealth and take it to another family upon her marriage. So you can imagine how disappointed he was the day Olympia was born. Well, how was he to know that this girl, this unwanted child, would immortalize the family name, that kings and prime ministers would bow down to her, that she would rule over the misogynists who ran the Catholic Church. Even as a child, it's said that Olympia had a commanding personality, and when she played with other children, she had to dominate the games, and she always had to win. She barely got any education apart from a stint at the convent of St. Dominic. Women were born to become wives, so educating them was frowned upon. She learned how to read and write Italian and to add and subtract and how to sew and religious studies. That's it. Very little education. But Olympia had been born with two gifts. One, she had a photographic memory. And two, with regards to financial matters, her mind was like a modern computer. Within seconds of analyzing an economic issue, her mind would show her the most advantageous outcome with percentages and all. And it's possible that she got this way because she watched her father very closely before he was a tax collector. The Turbo was a very beautiful medieval town with piazzas and fountains and palaces and towers. It's still very beautiful today. Let me share a few pictures. Beautiful place. All right. So it became a papal city in the 11th century because when Rome got too hot in the summer, the popes would retreat to Viterbo to ex escape the heat. Olympia had a very unhappy childhood. Her father had wanted a son from his second marriage. He got three daughters instead. And so um, he had hoped they would die young, but they did not. Imagine having a father like that. And as the daughters got closer to being of marital age, Sforza started panicking about the impact on his wealth. Because to marry honorably to a man of equal or higher status, a girl's dowry had to include cash, furniture, jewelry, livestock, and a house. So how was he going to do that three times for each daughter? Nope. He decided that all three daughters were going to become nuns, locked up at a convent. It cost way less, and it was still honourable. And additionally, they were all guaranteed a spot in heaven when they died. How lovely. <laughs> so being in a convent was like a maximum security prison where you had to go to mass and pray the rosary. You were not allowed to befriend other nuns at the convent. No pets. You prayed six times a day, and then you worked. And sometimes you were encouraged to even whip yourself. And the women were so lonely, some were driven to madness, and some um, took the chickens at the convent as their, their, their pets, because it was the only form of contact with another living thing they could have. And there were no windows that opened to the outside world. So that little convent and looking into the courtyard was your entire life. Relatives could visit you. But there was always an older nun standing by to eavesdrop on your conversations. And sometimes the drunk young men from the village would come in pretending to be relatives just so they could flash their body parts at the nuns. Charming. So the only men allowed into the convents were priests. But these visits often resulted in pregnancies. 
Uh, in fact, in 1614 is the year that those uh, grills were first introduced. Like if you're a Catholic, then you're familiar with these uh, grills that separate you from the priest when you go to confession. So they were first introduced around this time because a uh, priest used to uh, grope women or uh, molest them during confessions. Okay, so this was a life that Sforza chose for his three daughters. And the two younger ones were already locked up at convents. But 15-year-old Olympia refused to go. Technically, your father could not force you into a convent. But the standard practice was for a father to request and for the daughter to meekly obey. Like Before every uh, Catholic wedding, the bride is given a private interview with a priest or a bishop. And she's repeatedly asked if she's been married off against her will because it's not allowed in the Catholic Church. And it was the same thing for girls entering convents because it was a kind of marriage. You, you, were, you were marrying uh, Jesus or marrying the church. So I guess you were technically a, a widow. So the Council of Trent forbade deception or duress in getting girls uh, locked up at convents. And Sforza knew that Olympia was fearless and stubborn, so he couldn't force her to go. So he tried other means, tried to bribe her. She refused. He felt humiliated because everybody knew he'd asked Olympia to go and she refused. And there was nothing her father could do about it. So when threats and insults failed, her dad hired a priest to be with her 24-7. And his job was to cajole her and wear her down to break her will so she would just give in and go to the convent. He tried, but Olympia had a solution. She wrote a letter to the bishop complaining about what was happening. And she also accused the priest of sexually molesting her. He hadn't. Did not matter. <laughs> the poor priest was arrested found guilty and imprisoned for six months. His career crashed, ended right then and there. And her father had been put on notice by this because if he tried anything further, he'd get excommunicated from the Catholic Church. And so he gave up. And it was a huge scandal. And people whispered and pointed at her whenever she was outdoors. And this saddened Olympia deeply, but she hid it well, walked with her head held high, and she began to grow a thick skin. This victory had, had um, taught her an invaluable lesson. That as a power, powerless woman in a world ruled by men, her tools for survival would be manipulation, lies, and outright resistance. She was never going to let any man dominate her again. She will dominate them. And she would extend that protection to the women who had been forced into convents too. Her father didn't know what to do with her now. Because given the scandal, this girl that um, wasn't going to uh, go to the convent after all. And um, he was certain that no man would want anything to do with Olympia. He was wrong. The richest young man in the terrible wanted her. He was 22 years old, and his father had died, leaving him two palaces, as well as hotels, vineyards, shops, farms, and rental properties. And this is one of his palaces. His name was Paolo Nini, and he liked Olympia because of what she had done. She wasn't meek and obedient like all the other girls. She was rebellious and exciting. And she was also very smart. So Olympia's father noticed the way Paolo looked at her. He regularly invited Paolo to their home for uh, dinner parties and card games and things like that. And within a matter of months, the two were married. Olympia was 17 and Paolo was 22. Paolo accepted a very small dowry. So it was a win-win for her dad. For Olympia, she vowed that she would never be poor and powerless ever again. Now she was richer than her father and had more servants than he did. 
more property than he did. She took over the running of her husband's businesses within a short time. She regularly visited her sisters at the convent. She got pregnant, but she lost her first baby. And then a year later, she had a son. And life was good for a while. Soon after her son was born, her husband died. She was 20 years old at this time. And her uh, son only lived for a year before dying as well. She grieved for both of them. But now that they had both died, all the property and all the wealth belonged to her. She was a very wealthy widow. But even now, she still had the same two options. Either remarry or go into a convent. And her father already began angling for her properties and money. So she quickly dried her eyes and began to search for her next husband. She was 22 years old by now. And as a rich young widow, she was a chooser. So Olympia decided that she wanted a Roman husband who came from the nobility. Either a lord, a prince, or a count. And he needed to be easygoing and docile. Otherwise, Rome would not be big enough for the two of them. Enter Pamphilio Pamphili. He was descended from the Borgias and his uncle had been a cardinal. His younger brother, Giambattista, was a priest and a canon lawyer. So they still had the family name and the crumbling properties, but no money. They had been looking for an heiress like Olympia to help them cover their living expenses. So her prospective new husband was you know, a good-looking older man, very cultured and very easygoing. Not that any of that mattered to Olympia. She would have married him even if he'd had, had hooves and a tail. It was not a love match. He was a means to an end. Power. Olympia was never going to let any man try to lock her up ever again. And now that she was wealthy, she wanted a noble title and a husband whom she could use as a vehicle into the uh, power circles in Rome. Because Rome was ruled by political dynastic families and she wanted to have influence within those circles. Pamphylia on his part was lucky to get Olympia Many important families in Rome were, you know, also struggling financially. And there was a saying that they sometimes had to manure their estates. That is, trade their ancient lineage for the wealth of a family that they ordinarily wouldn't even look at twice. And so Olympia was their manure. <laughs> so they were married in November 1612. And Olympia became Donna Olympia, Lady Olympia. As a noble woman now, nobody will, you know, dare to put her in a convent. So Olympia's dad, Sforza, experienced a mix of pride and fear. Because she was taking the Maidokini name places, which was good. But he began to notice a certain look of disgust that his daughter was always giving him. Now that she was attaining power, he was wondering what she would do to him. And so he began to be much nicer to her. And he even contributed his own money and jewelry towards her dowry, even though she was way, way richer than him. So Olympia got married, moved to Rome and into the crumbling Pamphili family mansion, which was located in Piazza Navona. She loved the central location. But her two palaces back in Viterbo were way better. So it was a step down for her, actually. The house was close to the weekly vegetable market where farmers brought their donkeys to drink at the fountain in front of her home. And the street in front of her house was always littered with animal poop and rotting veg vegetables. There was no way in hell that Olympia would tolerate this for long. No way. 
And not too far from her house, there was a man named Pasquino, who was the town gossip. He was actually the Pope's tailor, so he always had the latest, juiciest gossip about the corruption, the sodomy and incest taking place at the Vatican. So now, there was this old Greek statue of um, Hercules that had been uh, discovered dug up from the sea and mounted somewhere in the middle of Rome. And so it became a gathering spot for all the followers of uh, Pasquino's gossip. <laughs> so th this place, I guess it was like the ancient version of Twitter, where everyone, you know, posted their opinions anonymously and, you know, all the gossip, that's where it was posted. It's one of the latest news is where you came to, to get it. And so people, especially students, would meet there late at night to gossip and drink and laugh. And the statue was aptly named Pasquino, and the followers of uh, Pasquino were called uh, Pasquinates. So it became the spot where anonymous opinions were vented in letters and poems. And as much as Olympia hated this, it was very easy for her to gather information about, you know, who was who, who mattered, and who didn't. And she was very well informed. And at this time, Rome was like the wild, wild west. You know, except that they drank wine and they killed you more elegantly. But, you know, there's still street fights and gang wars, lots of crime. And uh, Rome was half the size of London, London at this uh, point in time. And the population in Rome was uh, 100,000, as opposed to, I think it's 6 million now. The currency in use at this time was called Scudo. This is what it looked like. The economy was totally centered around the Pope and the church bureaucracy. So um, architects, painters, masons and carpenters built their palaces and homes. And sculptors, artists, gardeners and so on beautified their homes. Tailors, cobblers, hat makers and so on dressed them. Farmers, bankers, butchers, and fishmongers fed them, and then a huge chunk of the population worked as their servants. So the entire economy was centered around the, the Pope, the papacy. Olympia had thought, given her wealth, she would find it easy to ascend the social and political ladders in Rome. She was in for a rude awakening. Rome was a bastion of historical snobbery, so it was a greasy pole she was trying to climb. First, her usually laid-back husband had very strong views about the position of a woman, so every time she tried to, you know, give him advice or ask him what was going on, he would give her the uh, old Michael Corleone treatment. Don't ask me about my business. She disliked women. Olympia found women mostly vapid and ditzy because all they talked about was fashion, babies, and parties. And despite this, she needed to play the game by visiting and befriending Roman noble women. And these women's families could all uh, trace their lineages and ancestry back to the Crusades and the Knights Templar. They were related to... Uh, popes and cardinals, you know, descendants of multiple popes. And here was Olympia, a tax collector's daughter who just married well, nouveau riche. So they froze her out. Some things never change her. Huh? And in uh, Roman society, it was very easy to know your place. And you could tell where you, you, you stood socially by the uh, reception you got. Uh, when you visited a, a noble woman's home. So, if she was waiting outside for your carriage to arrive, then you were très, très important. You were very important, probably royalty. If she met you at the bottom of the staircase inside her mansion, you were moderately, you know, important. 
when she met you at the top of the stairs, you were, yeah, somewhat important. But if you were led by her butler right into the ladies' chambers, where she was lying down there and uh, and just, you know, said hello to you from there, then you were nobody. Can you guess what they did to Olympia? She would remember how they had all treated her and how they snobbed her. She already started plotting her revenge. Now, as her path seemed blocked on all sides, she focused her energy on charity work. She could be very tight-fisted with money, except when it came to helping women who'd been locked up in convents, i.e. nuns, because she was aware, you know, of how close she'd come to being in their position. And so she spoiled them every chance she got. Maybe survivor's guilt, I guess. She also began to establish dominance over her brother-in-law, Jean Batista. She bullied him out of all his antique furniture. And uh, he was a priest. And if uh, he played his cards right, he could uh, become a cardinal one day. He was terrified of Olympia. As a young man, he had been a womanizer and a habitual drunk. He had only joined the priesthood due to a family pressure. He couldn't freely associate with other women anymore, but Olympia was his sister-in-law, and so he could associate with her. And he saw her as someone he could confide in, because Gian Battista was indecisive to the point of paralysis. He had lost his mom quite young, and so he'd been looking for a, a surrogate mother. So even though Olympia was way younger than uh, him, uh, he liked talking to her. He would discuss his business with her and get her ad advice, and she reveled in it. And Olympia noticed that once she had made a decision for him, he obeyed completely. So the wheels in her head were spinning. He would be her path to power. So they became very close and they talked for hours every day. Her husband could have been her entree to political power in the civil authorities, you know, amongst lay people. But with her brother-in-law, if she, you know, got him into the right position, she would be influencing the Catholic Church, which ran the civil authorities. And that's what she wanted. Olympia was a ray of sunshine for him. She was charming, very intelligent, and she knew how to make him laugh. She gave him her complete loyalty. And for his part, uh, Gian Battista treated her like an equal, and he was the first person to ever show her true kindness. And they were always uh, taking carriage rides together and laughing, having a good time. And so rumors were beginning to spread that they were having an affair as if. <laughs> so Olympia decided that she would do everything in her power to make Gian Battista a cardinal. He already had all the qualifications, but he didn't know how to play power games, politics. Well, good thing he had a sister-in-law like Olympia. So she began to host these lavish parties at their home. And she would invite the who is who of Rome. Um, and then she would always make sure uh, that she, 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 she made Gian Battista shine at these events. She invited all the right people and charmed their pants off. She served the best wine, the best meat, the best fruit. Served them in crystal goblets on in gold plates. And after hosting so many such parties, she began to immerse herself into the Vatican. She was on first name basis with many cardinals and their relatives, especially their female relatives. And so the Pamphilis were becoming an up and coming family. And Olympia observed an important principle of power within this set. Keep your friends close and your friend and your <laughs> enemies closer. After all, if you want to stab someone in the back, it's always easier if you're standing right beside them, right? 
And so she began to pay uh, particular attention to all of uh, the cardinals who were considered papabile, that is, popable. One of the most popable was a close colleague of Giambattista's, and his name was Alessandro Ludovisi. And in 1621, he was indeed elected Pope. He became Pope Gregory XV. And within two months of his election uh, as Pope, uh, Olympia's work, be hand work be began to uh, pay off, and Giambattista was made a papal nuncio, which is the first step to becoming a cardinal. So now all those snobbish Roman ladies began to pay attention. Now they welcomed Olympia at the top of the stairs when she visited them. So Anuncia was uh, posted as a sort of ambassador for the Pope. And Giambattista was posted to Naples. Olympia made sure to drag her husband along and the whole family moved to Naples. So as a representative of the uh, Pope as Nuncio, uh, you were expected to work for the interests of the Vatican, manage all the Catholic Church's remedies in that place, set up an espionage network with spies, bribe all the right people from household servants to government officials, send weekly encrypted rep reports back to the Vatican, recommend people for honors, and keep all the right people happy. And the nuncio was expected to do all this with his own money. So it was uh, a good thing they had Olympia's money, right? Good thing she was rich. She actively participated in paying all the bribes, from bags of gold to uh, perfume gloves, which were the most highly coveted uh, bribes at the time because uh, perfume was rare and ambergris was expensive. So she paid particular attention to the uh, female relatives of all the right people. And Olympia didn't mind uh, paying for all this because she viewed it all as an investment. Uh, she was going to uh, get it all back if she played her card right and he became a cardinal. She also did all the plotting, the planning, and the manipulation. She dictated the coded letters. She was honing her skills, but she was also exercising real political power behind the scenes. Now, seven years into her marriage, she'd, she had a baby girl whom they named Maria. That's the only picture I have. I was able to find up Olympia with any of her kids. And when she had this baby, uh, people used to scrutinize uh, Maria's face to see if there was any resemblance to Gian Battista because people really believed that she was having an affair with her brother in law. And then shortly after arriving in Naples, she had a baby boy whom they named Camillo, and then soon after another daughter whom they named Costanza. In Naples, they lived in a nicer neighborhood in a posher home, but they were often accompanied by heavily armed uh, bodyguards because the crime, the level of crime in Naples was just unreal. You were almost always at risk of getting kidnapped, just going about your day within uh, the city. And if you were invited to a party in Naples, that meant that you were going to have to stay overnight for your own protection. Because the uh, level of crimes committed by both government officials and street gangs was so extreme. And it is uh, said that Naples is considered as the uh, birthplace of uh, Cosa Nostra, that is, the mafia, allegedly. Allegedly, I know nothing. I plead the fifth. Please don't come at me. So... Um, Olympia and her husband began to have problems due to her stubborn, independent nature. Uh, she didn't care that much, and she would often uh, visit her brother and her mom back home in Viterbo. She remained especially close to her brother Andrea until his death, and uh, she left her properties back in Viterbo all 
uh, in her mother's care. And she barely ever acknowledged her father's existence because she never forgave him. It was highly unusual uh, for properties like this to be left in the care of a woman. Olympia just didn't trust her father and just didn't like him very much. Anyway, back in Naples, their operation was so outstanding that when the old Pope died and the new one was elected, the new Pope allowed Gian Battista to continue on as a nuncio. And this was unusual because, because popes typically gave all the lucrative positions to their own relatives. Because the papacy is the only monarchy that is not heredi hereditary, as popes do not have children, as far as we know. So uh, popes would always appoint their nephews to positions of power. In fact, the word nepotism comes from this practice. Nepotism comes from the Italian word nepote, which means nephew. The practice of nepotism was so rampant in the Vatican that it even got this. Anyway. And by the way, did you know that uh, priests used to marry and have kids openly until the 11th century? I didn't know this, and I was raised Catholic. So, 40 popes were the sons of priests or the sons of other popes. And back then, when priests died, um, their wealth and their churches were inherited by their children and didn't belong to the Vatican. And so, for this reason, a crackdown began and priests were told to stop marrying so that when they died, their uh, properties reverted back to the uh, Vatican. In fact, in the year 1051, Pope Leo IX actually enslaved the wives of priests, forcing them to scrub churches, scrub floors, and cook for bishops. And, you know, in time, women began to find it less and less appealing to marry priests. And so it died down. And that's why they're celibate today. Anyway, so in 1629... Gian Battista was finally made a cardinal, and we can only imagine how elated Olympia was. Now, she was going to get back all the money she'd invested, plus interest. She'd always sit at the front row now during fest festivities, and she'd get the best seats at parties. And as a relative of the card a cardinal, she could be treated like a princess, and all those uppity Roman noble women would have to, have to greet her at the bottom of the stairs when she visited them. So shortly after Gian Battista's appointment, the Pope decided that Cardinal should now be addressed as Your Eminence, and that their rank was immediately below that of a king. And this ruffled royal feathers all over Europe. And it was at this time that princes and princesses began to get addressed as your highness <laughs> because their egos couldn't take being outranked by cardinals. So new cardinals were expected to give huge tips to all their household staff and to all the servants at the Vatican because it was important to ingratiate one's self to all these people because as a cardinal you were, you know, there was a possibility that you could become uh, a future pope and of course all these bribes came out from uh, Olympia's money because he hadn't started getting his money flowing in yet so for a lot of the cardinals who had only been appointed due to nepotism their duties were limited to um, reading all the dirtiest forbidden books in Europe and then writing reports about them but uh, not Gian Battista because he was actually qualified. So he was actually uh, qualified. So he uh, was appointed to the Council of Trent and also to the Office of the uh, Inquisition. And both were to do with uh, preventing protest and expansion. And they also contemplated the trial of a certain astronomer named. Galileo Galilei in 1633. 
uh, but there is no evidence that um, John Batista had any direct participation in the witch trials. So now that her brother-in-law was a cardinal and cash was flowing in, Olympia decided that it was time to upgrade her home. So she uh, bought the two homes next to hers and got all three incorporated into one huge palace. So because cardinals were basically princes of the church, so they needed a more imposing space where they could host and entertain Rome's wealthiest, most powerful residents, um, nobles, foreign dignitaries, ambassadors, and as such. And so Olympia oversaw all the re renovations and made sure it would be possible to have multiple waiting rooms, uh, banquet halls, and a theatre for plays and operas and other musical events. And she even commissioned the sculptor Bernini to uh, create lots of uh, sculptures for her and a fountain of Bernini. And he was also an expert at creating sunrise, uh, sunset, thunder, lightning, rain, hail, uh, storms and floods on stage. He was really talented. So Olympia uh, used him a lot for uh, the events she hosted at the home. In 1639, Pamphilio, Olympia's husband, died from kidney stones. So she was once, twice, three times a widow. This time, however, she was a rich, powerful widow, so no one could try to lock her up. This time, she had the power to administer her uh, financial and legal affairs herself by law. And she'd never cared much for fashion in the first place, and so widowhood gave her an excuse to care even less. Because from the day her husband died onwards, she only ever wore widow's weeds. So almost every portrait or picture you see of her is how she's dressed up. All the mirrors in their house and all the furniture were draped over with black cloth for eight months per tradition back then when you were in mourning. She mourned her husband. After all, they'd been married for 27 years. But she was also happy to be fully in charge. Gian Battista was a cardinal, but Olympia ran the show. She did most of his work for him. And if people wanted anything from him, they had to go through her. She also began to plot to marry her daughters into, you know, powerful families in Rome. And she did. And uh, in time, she became a grandmother. So widows were expected to completely vanish from society, to rarely speak, never laugh, and to stop wearing jewelry. Olympia always wore diamonds with her widow's weeds. She went to all the society events and was always front and center there. She regularly hosted late night gambling card games at her home, and she spoke to whomever she damn well pleased. But she was strategic about all the events she attended. And she preferred smaller dinner parties where she could talk to powerful men about finance and politics. Highly unusual for women back then. Her goal was always to garner support to eventually get John Battista elected Pope. So he was often present with her at these events. Uh, they did have one major obstacle in the way. And that was her arch nemesis, Cardinal Antonio Barberini. Barberini was related to the reigning Pope, Pope Urban, and he was going to lead the next uh, papal conclave. And he despised the Pamphili family because his previous lover had been from the Pamphili family and um, he had killed the young man when uh, their love affair was exposed. So it was a mix of uh, guilt and embarrassment that led him to hate the Banfilis. So the reigning Pope Urban uh, was gravely ill 
and this this Barberini guy would be in the way of Olympia realizing her ambitions. So for now, Olympia concentrated all her energy on winning over the other cardinals and foreign ambassadors from Catholic kingdoms and countries, paying particular attention to France and to Spain. And it was a balancing act because both countries were bitter rivals. Pope Urban died on uh, July 29th, 1644. And uh, Barberini performed the ancient ritual that is always done to this day when a Pope dies. He hit the Pope's head uh, three times with a silver hammer and called his name. And when uh, the Pope did not respond obviously it was certain that yes he was really dead then Barberini smashed the piscatory ring or the ring of the fisherman um, one of the most important emblems of a, po a pope's authority which is smashed after each pope dies and then once this was done uh, he uh, Barberini became the interim pope who would uh, oversee running the Vatican and conclave until the next pope was uh, elected. And if he played his cards right, he could become the, the pope officially. So the late uh, pope's relatives cleaned out all the valuables in his apartment, as was quite common back then. And then uh, Ten days after the Pope's death, Barberini declared that the conclave would begin. And so um, Olympia needed to work uh, very fast. And by the conclave uh, comes from the Latin conclave, which means with a key, locked with a key. Because uh, in conclave, the priests are sealed in a room in absolute secrecy, locked with a key uh, to select the uh, new Pope. Okay, so remember uh, Pasquino and Pasquinates, the uh, Twitter of uh, ancient Rome, the gossip network? Olympia used it to full effect now, mm -hmm. posting uh, fake news, <laughs> planting rumors, keeping her ears to the ground, planting spies in conclave. She had spent years buttering up all the right people. So now the conclave was her chessboard. And the night before the cardinals would get sealed into the conclave hall, Olympia and Gian Battista spoke privately for hours and hours. And no one knows what they discussed. She paid multiple bribes to all the important people to ensure that she knew exactly what was happening in that room. So messages were smuggled in and out on food trays. And she had already bribed all the guards at the door so that they would look the other way and let her messages pass through, unobstructed. So she was able to send messages and instructions all in code. She got fake beards, fake noses, wigs, and all kinds of disguises for the cardinal servants on her payroll so that at night they could go around and you know, skulk about, uh, you know, Put their ears to the doors and hear what was being whispered by the cardinals and uh, get information. So through her extensive network of spies, Olympia discovered that things did not bode well for Jean Battista because the uh, king of France, who was only six years old at this time, uh, through his ambassador had <laughs> instructed that uh, they should make sure Gian Battista was not elected Pope. Because uh, the arch enemy, Barberini, was a huge ally to, to France. He'd been instructed to announce that France would officially reject Gian Battista if he was elected Pope, and that if he somehow managed to get the votes, they would do what Henry VIII had done and abandon the Catholic Church. Spain, on the other hand, was all in for Gian Battista. And so this was a proxy war. And at this time, all the viable candidates for the uh, papacy 
had to be at least 60 years old and preferably sick so that they wouldn't be pope for too long. It was also preferred that um, he didn't have too many greedy relatives to uh, pilfer the Vatican's treasury. Gian Battista was 70 years old and he didn't have many relatives, but many cardinals and actually, in fact, even the general public were concerned about uh, Olympia's control over him and her greed. You know, they themselves were just as controlling and greedy as her, but they just resented the fact that she was a woman. So, Cardinal Sacchetti was favored to win. The conclave lasted one whole month from August to September. And each day, the cardinals had to vote four times. So Barberini and his, his agents did everything humanly possible to elect uh, Sacchetti as Pope. But Spain rejected him, even though he had been receiving the most votes. No amount of cajoling or bribes could help him. So they needed to consider alternative candidates. And so Giambattista's viability shot up. And um, the cardinals were getting sick from the extreme heat in Rome in August. So one day Olympia was at her palace at home when she heard her granddaughter scream from one of the rooms. So along with a bunch of servants, um, Olympia rushed to, towards the, the sound of the screams and they got into uh, Gian Battista's bedroom where the granddaughter was and they saw a white dove had flown in and perched on Gian Battista's bedpost and it was flapping its wings and no matter how many times they tried to, to chase it out it wouldn't leave and the family's uh, crest had a white had a dove on it and so Olympia took it as a sign from above that Gian Battista was going to be the next Pope but they still had this uh, Barberini guy in their way he was still an obstacle and he was afraid of the Pamphili family not just because of the assassination but also because his family had stolen so much money from the Vatican that he he feared a prosecution and so um, Olympia began uh, decided to uh, play her final card she smuggled a message to him in conclave and uh, Olympia called for a truce and swore that if Gian Battista was elected Pope they would not uh, prosecute him or his family for all their theft in fact she would arrange for her son to marry one of the Barberini's nieces. Because, you know, regardless of how voting went, only Barberini could create the next pope. She needed him. She had to do this. And he had strong ties to France. So if she could get him over to her side, he could potentially help sway the votes from the French bloc, you know, to her side because he controlled a big block of votes that Olympia needed. And uh, Barberini looked in, because oh, now that he couldn't get Sacchetti, none of the other uh, candidates really appealed to him. So he began to uh, consider Olympia's proposition, but he knew that all the other allies of France would turn on him if he openly agreed to Olympia's proposition. So he did everything. He made all his, his arrangements secretly. And then he immediately arranged for the vote to take place before the French side figured things out and scuttled his plans with a coup or something. And so the vote took place on the morning of September 15th, 1644. And when it was all over, Barberini announced... Benedictus Dominus Noster, Habemus Cardinalem Pamphilium Pontificum. In English, Our Blessed Lord, 
we have Cardinal Pamphili as Pope. To which Cardinal Alessandro Pici declared to his friends, gentlemen, we have just elected a female Pope. Olympia was beside herself with happiness, bouncing off the walls from joy. And she suddenly looked like a 25-year-old woman now, just elated. Back at the Vatican, most of the cardinals were falling all over themselves to congratulate Gian Battista. He decided that he would use the name Innocenzo X, Innocent X. At this time, they hadn't started using the, you know, black smoke, white smoke signals at the Vatican yet. So the uh, indication that a new pope had been elected came when the bells, the church bells at St. Peter's Basilica pealed and uh, John Battista was led behind the, uh, alt the Sistine Chapel altar. Uh, his cardinal's robes were taken off and the other cardinals dressed him in the magnificent papal robes made from the finest silks and linen and velvet and ermine. He wore his hat and then he was led to the Pope's throne. And he sat down and the, the Sistine, uh, Sistine Chapel Choir was singing this angelic music as one by one all the other cardinals came up to him, kissed his feet, and kissed his right hand. A pope is a king, you know. <laughs> so outside in uh, St. Peter's Square, huge crowds gathered around. And by the way, this uh, design uh, was purposely done. It's supposed to... Um, be the welcoming arms of the church, welcoming the faithful. So anyway, the uh, huge crowds had gathered and they were waiting to meet the new king. <laughs> he came out of the balcony and the ecstatic crowds greeted him as every church bell in Rome rang at the same time. And the people were especially happy because he was a son of Rome, a true Roman Pope, because only Romans understand Rome. But even so, people began to whisper about Olympia the dominatrix. After all, <laughs> 32 years of her hard work had led to this moment. So if the Pope was a king, she was now the queen. And all those snooty noble women will now have to greet her outside, waiting for her carriage to arrive. For the first time in her life, she felt truly safe. So the jubilant crowds from St. Peter's Square rushed to her palace and she personally let them in. Because per tradition, now that uh, her family was ascending to the papacy, she'd hit the jackpot and she wouldn't need all you know, the valuable things in her home. And so the people rushed there to go take everything from her house. But Olympia didn't care because <laughs> she'd already stashed all her paintings, all her silverware, all her jewelry, and all her furniture somewhere safe. So they only got the cheap things and they were disappointed. So uh, she went to visit Gian Battista at the Vatican. And like all visitors, she was expected to kiss his feet when greeting him. For he was in tears when he saw her, and he didn't let her. She had made him Pope. In fact, she was going to rule the Vatican and the Catholic Church. So Olympia immediately began to march through the <laughs> papal apartments and order the servants around. And in the days that followed, countless guests became to visit her at the palace and began to refer to her as Your Excellency from princes to ambassadors, to noble ladies, to cardinals. You know, Olympia had initially planned to move into the Vatican and stay in an adjoining suite to the popes that had a connecting door, like both bedrooms had a connecting door. 
But when the cardinals heard about it, they were apoplectic. What? But just incandescent with rage about how scandalous that would be. This woman, whom everyone thought was the Pope's mistress, living at the Vatican with him with <laughs> an adjoining bedroom. Absolutely not. And it was unanimous. So even Olympia knew she had gone too far, and so she backed out. But she had carte blanche to visit the Pope any time, day or night. And as he was a night owl, she usually visited him in the evenings. She usually went there at dinner time, and she stayed there until midnight. And at his coronation on October 4th, he was given his um, fisherman's ring, which is only created by the Vatican jeweler exclusively. And um, he was dressed in his robes of authority and given his triple crown. And Olympia was front and center at the coronation. And she actually had a more honorable seat than all the blue bloods. After all, it was her coronation too. The new Pope had already changed his will and now Olympia would inherit everything when he died. He had also conferred royal titles on the families that Olympia's daughters had married into, making all of them princesses. And he also made uh, Olympia a princess. So um, Olympia's son refused to marry the Barberini girl that, you know, Olympia had uh, promised. And instead, he decided that he wanted his uncle to make him a cardinal. And so he was made a cardinal. Olympia was furious, but she couldn't do anything about it. Her son hated her because she was too domineering and bossy. So Olympia got the Pope to ban that weekly vegetable market near her palace. And now she bought the two additional houses that were uh, near her house and incorporated them so now it was five houses in one and now that she had unlimited funds at her disposal she hired the best of the best best sculptors artists craftsmen and engineers to redesign her home let me share a short video uh giving a bit of history about her palace in piazza uh, navona which uh, has housed the Brazilian embassy since 1920. Of all the piazzas in Rome, Piazza Navona is arguably the most famous. It takes its name and its unique shape from the fact that it was once an ancient Roman stadium. And a stadium was a place where the Romans would come to enjoy agones or athletic competitions in fact when you walk into the piazza navona you'll notice that it looks a bit like a field and track the piazza was essentially uh, lost with the fall of the roman empire but then in the 17th century came back to life with the election of cardinal giovanni battista pamphili to pope and he took the name Innocent X. And Innocent decided to transform this area of Rome into his own personal enclave. Essentially hiring Rome's most celebrated artists to come in and bring this piazza back to life. Names like Gian Lorenzo Bernini, like Francesco Borromini, who in fact were the two major protagonists of Baroque Rome, who transformed this into an urban theater, a place where architecture and sculpture and painting all come together to create this extraordinary identity that is the city of Rome. The crown sculptural jewel of the piazza is the Four Rivers Fountain that was created by John Lorenzo Bernini in the 1650s. Now consider that John Lorenzo was persona non grata over at the Vatican because of an architectural disaster that had caused the collapse of a bell tower on the facade of St. Peter's. And in fact, in order to win this commission, he had to secretly submit his design for the fountain. A design that was ultimately chosen by Pope Innocent X 
and that celebrates essentially the four largest known rivers in the 17th century. The Nile with its head covered, because of course the source was still unknown, the Ganges River, the Danube, and in fact uh, there is one figure there reaching up, holding up the coat of arms of the Pamphili family, and that figure represents the figure uh, that is the Danube River, essentially the river closest to the reign of the Pope himself. But it's that fourth river, the Riva de la Plata, because remember, we are New World at this point. That, in fact, attracts most attention because with that raised right hand, almost as if he was shielding his face, one of the greatest legends of Rome was, in fact, born. And that is that the uh, Riva de la Plata figure is hiding its face from the ugliness of the church that stands just across the way called St. Agnes in Agone because that church was in fact designed by Francesco Borromini, who is the legendary rival of the sculptor Bernini. In reality, the Church of Sant'Agnese is nothing more than the family chapel of the enormous Palazzo Pamphili, which occupies more than a half of the entire Piazza Navona. It was designed by the great Francesco Borromini, the father of Baroque architecture. And he here shows us how these convex and concave forms come together to form these moving, these dynamic facades with those two framing towers that you see as well. And one of the greatest legends of Baroque Rome is the fact that the Fountain of the Four Rivers and the Church of Sant'Agnese are competing with each other. Because that figure of the Riva de la Plata in Bernini's fountain, raising that left hand almost in disgust in relation to the church that's just across the way. But Borromini would have his revenge with the statue of St. Agnes up there, who doesn't even look down at Bernini's fountain. And the idea that these two artistic rivals were in fact showing that rivalry through their great masterpieces here in the Piazza Navona. Now, unfortunately, everyone, that legend is not true because the fountain was here long before the palace ever was. And there's no way that Bernini could have known that Borromini was going to build here. So in this case, that legend, unfortunately, is not true. Pope Innocent had nothing to do with commissioning anything. It was all Olympia. So if by Pope he means Olympia, then he's right. So the uh, home, the palace, even has the keys of heaven, also known as uh, St. Peter's keys on the front of it, which is another, another emblem of the papacy. It was an extremely lavish palace. The words cannot do it justice. You have to be able to go in yourself and see it, if you're Brazilian, I guess. <laughs> so, yes, she lived in the lavish uh, palace, but Giambattista also lived in one of the most lavish palaces on earth, surrounded by countless secretaries, cooks, translators, accountants, lawyers, tailors, embroiderers, jewelers, and a special Sistine Chapel choir that sang just for him during his meals. He also had 200 elite bodyguards who were the best trained mercenaries in the world, a little unit known as the Swiss Guard. Please, 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 when you visit Rome, do not mess with these people. You see this ridiculous uniform they wear and you think they're jokers? These are... These men belong to like they're some of the best trained military operatives in the world, and some of the best trained killers in the world. Please don't mess with the Swiss Guard. So even with all this uh, stuff that the uh, Pope had, Olympia always washed his underwear and shirts because apparently it was what Pope's sisters and sisters-in-law had always done. Now remember that priest whom she had falsely accused of molesting her when she was 15 years old. She found him and summoned him to her palace in Rome. She showed him around her palace and then she asked him, where would I have been today if I had followed your advice? And he couldn't answer her because she would have been living a very different life had she gone to that, you know, life in prison and locked up at the convent. 
and he considered that she'd done the right thing by following her own path. And so when Olympia was done, she got uh, Gian Battista, the Pope, to make this priest a bishop. After all, Olympia had wrecked his career those like, nearly 40 years ago. Olympia then turned her attention to bettering the lives of two groups of women, nuns and prostitutes, because both had been forced to live lives they did not want. So while nuns were basically serving life imprisonment, the prostitutes in Rome were mostly at the service of Catholic priests. You know, uh, Pope Pius V had tried to banish prostitution in Rome, but the Senate begged him not to, explaining that the priests would come after the wives and children of Roman citizens if uh, prostitution was banned in Rome. So these exploited women were a necessary part of the structure. And so Olympia took them under her wing and she became their official protector for a price. So prostitutes began to fix her coat of arms over the doors of their homes as a warning sign to um, church officials and the police. That's her coat of arms. Warning to you know church officials and the police that they were now under the personal protection of probably the most powerful woman in the world. Because Olympia's power extended beyond Rome and the Vatican and into every Catholic kingdom. When kings and queens visited, they bowed to Olympia. So uh, prostitutes had not been allowed to ride in carriages because they would get arrested. But now, if they painted Olympia's coat of arms on their carriages, they could ride in carriages. So whenever Olympia's carriage was uh, taking her to the Vatican to see the Pope, she was accompanied by a convoy of women in their carriages, all bearing her coat of arms. She didn't ask them to do it. They just did it. They were so proud of her. Women were so proud of Olympia. And so uh, women from all over the Catholic world would come to uh, Rome. They would line the streets and applaud her as her carriage went by. She was like a rock star. And these women just followed her everywhere. It was almost a religious experience. And Olympia uh, built a town for dowerless girls. That's um, girls whose fathers could not afford to pay dowries for them. So rather than uh, getting them locked up at convents, their fathers could come dump them at this town and Olympia would take care of them. Women loved her. Anyway, so she usually arrived at the Vatican armed with religious petitions for the Pope to sign. And she would tell the cardinals exactly what she wanted them to do in the Pope's presence. And the Pope would just nod in agreement. <laughs> Seriously, even today, it's hard to imagine something like this happening. A woman ordering um, cardinals around <laughs> in the presence of the Pope. Impossible. So some of the cardinals were astonished. Some were enraged. But some used it to their advantage. After all, there was nothing they could do about it. So they played the game. They began to befriend her, be fawned over her, sent her presents, flattered her, and hung her portraits in the rooms where they received guests. They hung her portraits right up next to the Pope's portraits. And they usually got what they wanted from Olympia, usually after uh, giving her a nice bribe. And her palace at uh, Piazza Navona was always crowded with the carriages of the powerful and their representatives. Because if you wanted anything from the Pope, you had to go through her. Kings, cardinals, bishops, it did not matter who you were. Now, these men were forced to pay attention to a woman. And even the ones who hated her, admired her, and conceded that she was a genius. She spoke like a government minister. 
She was the hostess when princes visited the Vatican. She managed the Vatican's expenses and Vatican's finances. She was the Pope. And all these things are corroborated by letters written by various ambassadors and cardinals. So it's not hearsay. And they're all stored in the Vatican vaults to this day. And also at um, other royal courts in Europe that received correspondence from Rome, from their ambassadors. And in these uh, correspondences, she's often described as a lady of intelligence with a masculine spirit. So many other women had wielded power at the Vatican before. For example, Pope's mistresses like uh, Cecil, Countess of uh, Turin, and uh, women like uh, Julia Farnese, who was a Pope's mistress. And then another one was um, Lucrezia Borgia, who was the daughter to a Pope. But the difference was that these women wielded soft power behind the scenes, right? They were willing to play the damsel in distress to get what they wanted. Not Olympia. She was brazen. She knew she was smarter than all these men, and she, boy, did she rub it in. They despised her. So Olympia began her reign as Pope with a very dangerous enemy. And his name was Cardinal Mazarin. He was the Prime Minister of France. He had uh, failed uh, to deliver the uh, Pope that France wanted. Well, or you could just see the Pope that he wanted. Because the King of France was just six years old. So technically, he was the one advising the King of France. And he'd been betrayed by France's former ally, Barberini. And thanks to Olympia, this man had been forced to kiss the feet of the Pope he despised and to congratulate him. So there are no words to describe the anger and the hate that he felt towards the Pope and towards Olympia. And he could barely even hide his hatred. So, you know, France had stripped Barberini of all the goodies France had given him. Uh, but with Olympia and with the Pope, he needed to conceal his intentions. If he wanted whatever he needed, if he needed anything from them, he was going to have to conceal his intentions and his hatred. And so he uh, gave a, a title to Olympia's son and he sent a tribute to the Pope and he repeatedly sent his agents and ambassadors to Olympia's gambling events to purposely lose money to her. But this was her favorite way to uh, receive bribes. It was more fun for her than just receiving, you know, diamond necklaces or bags of gold because she enjoyed winning. And so when the French ambassador had lost a lot of money to Olympia, she finally asked him what he wanted. And the, the request from Mazarin was that he wanted his brother to be made a cardinal because he was trying to uh, consolidate his own power base and angle to become Pope, possibly, during the next um, conclave. Because Mazarin was only Prime Minister of France because he was dating the boy king's mother. He wasn't even French. He was Italian. He was Italian and he was the Prime Minister of France. <laughs> anyway, the Pope refused to make his brother a cardinal because Olympia and the Pope knew how much he hated them. Why give your enemy power to hurt you? So Mazarin decided that the best way to get revenge was to join forces with Barberini. Now that um, Olympia's um, promised marriage with uh, between her son and the Barberinis had fallen apart. I had to join forces. After all, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And uh, the two did join forces because the Pope also uh, broke his promise 
because you remember Olympia had sworn that they would not prosecute the Barbarinis for corruption. Well, they did. And this is an even bigger betrayal because it even forced Cardinal Barberini to flee Rome and to seek asylum in France. Olympia was making a lot of enemies. She made fun of everybody, including the Pope and even herself at these plays that she hosted at her home. She knew how to laugh at herself, but I guess she didn't realize that not everybody liked uh, being made fun of or laughed at. Anyway, meanwhile, Olympia's son, Camillo, who had been made a cardinal, he suddenly decided one day that he was bored with being a cardinal. And, you know, I said that before, one didn't need to be a priest to become a cardinal at this time. Because it was more like an honorary position that you could just drop if you wanted. And Camillo, um, Olympia's son, had found a woman he wanted to marry. Her name was Princess Olympia Aldobrandini. And she was the total package. She was so irresistibly beautiful that even the holiest men's jaws dropped when they saw her. And she dressed beautifully. She was in excellent shape. And she'd descended from multiple popes. She'd married into the um, Borghese family. She was a, a widow and heiress. And uh, Villa Borghese was her home. She was very well educated and spoke six languages her pedigree was impeccable she could have any man she wanted and she knew it and as it turns out she wanted olympia's son because if she married him she will become the new queen the new first lady of rome the position that her prospective mother-in-law had spent 40 years working to attain <laughs> all other women were intimidated by Donna Olympia but Princess Olympia was not she was a fighter and she loved to win as far as personality she and uh, Donna Olympia were exactly the same she was just as ambitious as Olympia and she loved a fight now there's this old Italian proverb that goes between a daughter-in-law and a mother-in-law, the devil is at work. And this was about to play out. The Camellia proposed to her and she accepted. So the claws had been sharpened now and everybody in room was watching out to see how this cat fight would play out. And the most painful thing is that Donna Olympia was the one who'd instigated the whole thing. She had encouraged her son to have an affair with the princess in hopes that she could distract her son and take over his duties. And her plan backfired spectacularly because her son had fallen in love with him and was now prepared to renounce his title as cardinal and to marry instead. Olympia's biggest fear was that the Pope would fall under the spell of this beautiful princess and that she, Donna Olympia, would be replaced by her daughter-in-law. And all of Europe was watching and praying that it would happen. Nope. Donna Olympia was not going to let it happen. She told her son that if he wanted to marry, she would only permit him to marry the Barberini girl whom she'd you know, previously arranged for him. This one was a 17-year-old girl who was awkward, shy, obedient, flat-chested, and had a face full of pimples. And so Olympia's son refused, hands down, to marry the Barberini girl. So now, Donna Olympia's enemies swooped in. This was their chance to get rid of her and replace her with her daughter-in-law. So they sided with her son and encouraged him to marry the princess. They began to lobby the Pope on his behalf to make sure the marriage went through. It was a huge international scandal now. So Donna Olympia and the Pope had a long talk and decided that they would allow the couple to have a very small, quiet wedding 
and then exiled them far, far away from Rome immediately. Because Rome wasn't going to be big enough for both these, these women. So the wedding took place, but in a show of unity, both Donna Olympia and the Pope did not attend. And after the wedding, Olympia and the Pope made peace with France. So now they not only neutralized France as, as her son's allies, but Olympia had a new source for uh, bribes for herself as well. So the princess was very unhappy living far away from, from Rome. But uh, she soon got pregnant in exile. And then, without the Pope's permission, she returned to Rome because she wanted to make sure she gave birth in Rome. She knew that her mother-in-law was planning to uh, accuse her of faking her pregnancy because if she gave birth outside of Rome, Olympia could uh, accuse her of having used a, a surrogate and claiming that wh whomever the child was didn't belong to her son. So... Uh, the princess not only returned to Rome to give birth, but she arranged for a public birth with multiple witnesses, invited the entire nobility to watch her give birth. And she began hosting these dinner parties to taunt her mother-in-law. So she did give birth in public. She gave birth to a baby boy and she named him after the Pope. Genius move. Donna Olympia threw a fit. <laughs> the Pope lifted their exile because he was very flattered that they named their child after him. So lifted their exile and welcomed them back to Rome fully. And the international community celebrated the boy's birth as if he were a royal prince. There were fireworks and cannons and parties and the like. But Donna Olympia insisted that they could only return to Rome if they lived a quiet life and stayed out of politics. She didn't want any threats to her power. It was hard-earned. So uh, Donna Olympia still felt threatened because now the Pope had rejected three consecutive requests that she'd made to him. And she began to feel that her grip on power was slipping. And so because she was feeling insecure, she began to get into public shouting matches with her son and a few cardinals. And now she became the main subject of the gossip in town by uh, Pasquino and all his agents. And it was vicious. And most of it could be traced back to her daughter-in-law. So Donna Olympia was becoming a liability to the Pope. But she seemed to be blissfully unaware of it. She didn't know the things that had happened that were, you know, getting under the Pope's skin. For instance, the Pope had turned down a request from a certain king. And the king's ambassador openly said to the Pope, if you won't do it, we will go to Donna Olympia and she'll make you do it. And then another ambassador showed the Pope copies of the cartoons mocking him and calling her, uh, calling uh, Olympia La Papesa, like the Lady Pope, or Olympia the First. He had, had even minted medals that showed her sitting on St. Peter's throne with a crown and with the, the the Pope sitting with curls in his hair like a woman because he was completely beholden to her. People saw him as a joke, completely beholden to a woman. And some kings and queens didn't even bother sending their ambassadors to the Pope and they went directly to Olympia. So all these things got under his skin. But Olympia was not aware of it. So the next time she arrived at the Vatican and began you know, issuing orders to all the cardinals and venting about one of the cardinals that had annoyed her, the Pope interrupted, shut up, just shut up. And then 40 years of pent up anger came pouring out. He threatened to lock her up in a convent if she ever told him what to do again. She was a woman and her place was to obey, not to command. He went on a tirade of insults and threats. He shouldn't have. After 40 years together, surely he knew what her father had done to her and, and how vindictive she could be. 
He was the one man she had expected to always love and protect her, especially after everything she'd done for him. It was the ultimate betrayal. Donna Olympia was terrified. If the Pope decided to lock her up, nobody could stop it. He could lock her up and throw away the keys and no power on earth could help her. So she was 15 years old again. She did shut up. She was too shocked and heartbroken to say anything. And he banished her from uh, his presence and from coming to the Vatican. And her power evaporated immediately. All her enemies celebrated her downfall. And people began to treat her with contempt and disdain. The Pope imprisoned her accountant and launched an investigation into her finances. So Olympia packed up her bags and left Rome and returned to Viterbo, her hometown. So now the Pope reconciled with the princess and invited her to the Vatican. And now the princess became the new First Lady of Rome. So she was the one meeting with the Pope and uh, advising him. She gloated in her victory and threw many parties with Donna Olympia's enemies to dance on her grave. Well, Donna Olympia recovered and moved on with her life, relocating to her um, palaces and building her town to, uh, to her town, uh, San Martino, the town that she built for uh, the Daoist girls, and it pretty much looks the same as it did back then. She still had her network of spies at the Vatican and friends in high places. So, you know, while she was uh, back hopping from palace to palace, from town to town that she owned, renovating her places, she was still keeping up with the affairs at the Vatican and everything else going on. And any person with half a brain should have known that Donna Olympia would rise again. So the Pope had thought Donna Olympia was too corrupt and the things would improve in her absence. He was sorely mistaken because now that she was gone, he finally saw just how corrupt the people all around him truly were. Despite her greed and her corruption, Donna Olympia had been keeping the corrupt officials in check and now they were all out of control and the Pope didn't know how to handle it. Everything had gotten worse. The novelty had worn off on his friendship with the princess. Because uh, she kept on asking him for money and favors, and she was always complaining and nagging, and her marriage was falling apart. So the Pope was tired of her. And Donna Olympia couldn't have been happier because everything was falling apart for the Pope, and she hadn't lifted a finger to cause any of it. It was far, far away when it all went wrong for him. The Pope became severely depressed and he began to fire all his advisors. He lashed out at all his relatives and became suspicious and paranoid. Now, suddenly, Donna Olympia's old enemy began to yearn for her return. As greedy and corrupt as she had been, she'd kept the Vatican running smoothly for six years. She had controlled the Pope's relatives, managed the Vatican's finances, and kept everybody in line. So Olympia's son, who hated her, along with Olympia's uh, staunchest enemies at the Vatican, all went to uh, have an intervention with the Pope and asked him to bring Donna Olympia back. And even the Pope on his side, he missed her. He missed her. Yes, she could be difficult and bossy. But she was also funny. She could always make him laugh. She was the one person he could confide in when he was afraid. And she had never betrayed him. She'd been his chief strategist and nothing had been right since she left. So he began to ask all the cardinals what they thought. And without exception, they all agreed that uh, Donna Olympia made life much easier. So... Romans were shocked when three years after 
uh, going into exile, uh, Donna Olympia returned to Rome, and she received the Queen's welcome. And in no time, her palace was filled with cardinals and ambassadors again, and they began bringing her uh, gifts and asking for favors. So she received uh, bags of <laughs> diamonds and uh, gold watches and uh, diamond tiaras and uh, pearl tiaras and paintings and just all kinds of things. And as the bribes poured in, results followed for all those people. The Pope was back to his happy, relaxed self. Life was good. And Olympia was very happy too. Because first she was back in power, but now she was also in a position to exact revenge on all the people who'd messed with her. She reveled in it. First, she banished the princess from seeing the Pope, except at family events. But this time there were no shouting matches. It was a cold war now. But Olympia, Don Olympia, reserved her venom for the Pope. It was going to be a slow carefully planned and executed revenge she had made him and she'd stayed loyal to him for 40 years and he threw her to the wolves and humiliated her internationally no she was going to get him back so the pope was in his late 70s by now and he was not was not in the best health so uh olympia decided that this was the time to uh secure herself this time she was going to put herself first she was number one she didn't care about him that much anymore so she was going to take care of herself so that when the next pope came in she'd still be fine and her biggest threat was still cardinal barberini her old uh rival so she arranged for uh her 12 year old granddaughter to marry into the barberini family it was a very powerful family and so by joining their houses, she was now protected finally from them. But even though she'd gotten this protection for the future, for now, she still needed the current Pope to hang on because now she was on a mission to enrich herself as much as possible. So seeing that he wasn't doing too well, she arranged a very relaxing uh, trip, a three-month holiday for him in Viterbo at her two palaces. And arranged to make sure everything was, you know, he was very well taken care of when he was there. And he returned very sprightly, invigorated, and looking 10 years younger. So now Donna Olympia was on a mission to get as much money as she could before he died. So she took over even more of the Pope's duties than she'd previously done. And she was uh, selling positions to people and she began slowly emptying out the Vatican as a gold treasury. She set up many of her enemies and had them exiled from Rome. And she kept befriending the cardinals and keeping her eye out you know, for whoever she thought was most likely to become the next pope. And she also made sure to personally hand select every new cardinal that... Uh, Pope Innocent created so that uh, the new conclave will be stacked in her favor and she'll be ready for anything when her brother-in-law died. It took her a few years to do this. She bided her time and arranged everything well. Okay, so now the year was 1654 and strange things began to happen. So first, uh, a huge section of the Colosseum suddenly collapsed. A huge section, like up to uh, four uh, sections like this just suddenly collapsed. Four arches. And then half of the city was burnt down. And then there were these strange lights in the night sky. UFOs that looked like a torch lit procession in the skies over Rome. And after that, have you ever seen the Northern Lights? Uh, 
it began to happen in Rome. And then after that, there was a solar eclipse in Rome that left the city in almost complete darkness for three hours. And for centuries, an eclipse was seen as a prediction that a king or queen was about to die. And so the Pope got very sick again. But this time, everybody was sure he was going to die. He was bedridden for 45 days. He was that sick. So Olympia received all his guests on his behalf. And she saw that his mind was starting to slip away from him. So she kept him hidden. She was at the height of her power during the last few months of his life. All petitions and requests were sent directly to o Olympia now, as if the Pope did not exist. And the Pope had told her to do whatever she wanted, and she did. So, specifically in the last uh, six weeks of his life, she began emptying all the gold in the Vatican treasury. So she'd get the gold out in this huge chest and then get them moved into the Pope's bedroom hidden under his bed and then she'd lock him up in his bedroom throughout the day and then um, at night she'd line up her carriages and have her servants move the chest of gold into the carriages and to her palace. And around this time when word spread about the uh, uh, Pope's um, condition, mobs began to target Olympia's carriage in the streets and to throw poop at, at her. And she only got away each time by throwing gold coins at them. So for her security, she was mostly cooped up at the Vatican most of the time, but she was never allowed to sleep there. And as happens with um, powerful women during these uh, kinds of times, now she became the scapegoat for everything that was going wrong with the economy. Room wasn't safe for her, but she had these last few things to do, which were to empty out the Vatican's gold reserves. So uh, she going to move them in, in her wagons night af after night. And as um, his death was imminent, the Pope invited his relatives and cardinals to his deathbed to make peace with all of them. And it was finally time for his last rites. And so his bedroom was usually crowded around this time. And so Olympia had some difficulty moving her gold chest into his bedroom or moving them from under his bed because all the crowds were there and she couldn't do it. But she didn't really care about him anymore. So even as he uh, lay dying and as he was sick, she didn't uh, bother really taking care of him and his body really fell apart badly as he lay dying but everybody else well all his relatives and servants were just concerned with stealing every valuable thing he had in his uh, bedroom it was so bad that you know one day uh, someone came to feed the pope and there wasn't even a spoon with which to feed him soup so the servant had to go buy spoons and bowls from the market to even feed him his bed had no blankets on them just cheap bed sheets and so on January 7th 1655 the innocent died half naked in a pauper's bed and after he died and his body was being ceremonially washed Olympia rushed into his room and took away her remaining gold chest and then ran away to her palace and barricaded herself in there. The Vatican treasury was completely empty. And so uh, church officials couldn't even afford to buy a coffin or to pay for his funeral. So they came to... Um, Donna Olympia to ask for help. After all, the Pope had made her a princess. He had given her towns. He'd given her castles. He'd given her art collections. The old palaces he'd given her. And he'd given her millions 
in gold. At least at least two million scudo in gold. And now, when uh, these people uh, came to ask her to pay for his funeral, for the first time in her life, Olympia played the damsel in distress. How was she supposed to pay for his coffin? She was only a woman. She was just a poor widow. How could they expect her to pay for his coffin and his funeral? She didn't have money. She couldn't afford anything. She needed their help and their protection. She was a poor widow. And the same thing, when they went to the other relatives, they all refused to help. And so uh, Giambattista's body was kept in the janitor's closet where it began to rot and get eaten by rats. Olivia didn't care. This was her revenge. You shouldn't have done what he had done to her. And when the stench became too unbearable, some of the cardinals uh, threw together some money and got him a cheap wooden coffin. And that's what he was buried in. And soon a new pope was elected at the next conclave. And that was Pope Alexander VII. He did not particularly like Olympia or women in general, but he was a very honest and principled man. And so the gravy train had crashed for Olympia. No more limitless power, no more money, no more bribes. But the new pope ultimately decided not to go after Olympia, otherwise she would have been imprisoned for life. He didn't make her pay restitution for the bribes she'd taken and for the... Uh, Positions she'd stolen, uh, she, she'd sold, and for all that she'd stolen from the Vatican, and she was then exiled from Rome permanently. But well, she didn't care. Well, shortly after she left, because she left in 1655, in 1656, the following year, the bubonic plague swept through Europe and it killed millions of people. And unfortunately for her, Gunnar Olympia was one of them. So she succumbed to the plague on September 26, 1657, at the age of 66. Her servants also robbed her blind as she lay dying, and so her body was found naked on her bed with no sheets on it. And legend has it that um, when they came to take her body for burial, three huge diamonds were found inside her mouth. And so it's possible that she probably hid those um, diamonds in her mouth to uh, prevent her thieving a servant from taking them. Luckily for Olympia, she built her own tomb years prior while she was at the height of her power. So that's where she was buried. This is her tomb. She built it exactly the way she wanted it. So... After she died, her son and the princess inherited her wealth, and they really enjoyed her wealth. Uh, today, her living descendants include the Hollywood actress Brooke Shields. And Brooke Shields' sister is actually named Olympia, after Donna Olympia. So, this poor girl, 15-year-old girl from Viterbo was able to live this life and achieve all this because she had the guts to say no. And she, her story was largely forgotten outside of Italy until her painting, which was done by the Spanish master um, Velasquez was discovered after 300 years and her painting sold at Sotheby's for three million dollars and now to conclude would you like to see some of Olympia's treasures including some of the bribes she received the furniture and paintings and such because it got passed down through her family her granddaughter uh, married into the Doria family, and so they merged their names into Doria Pamphili. 
And so her wealth went down, you know, inherited by her descendants. And it's now housed in the Doria Pamphili Gallery in Rome. So we need to share a video about that to conclude. Thus, and at the lesson, we've come to the end of this presentation. I really hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. It was really wonderful and riveting to read. And see you at the next one. Ciao, ciao!